Good morning, everyone. Welcome to service. If you're new here to Faith Wellen, we want to take this time right now to welcome you specifically. Simply grab a Connect card located in the pew in front of you and take it to the back later on in exchange for a small gift. Just our way of saying, thanks for coming and we hope to see you again. Samaritan's Purse Shoebox Campaign is officially underway. You can pick up your shoeboxes at the Connect Center today or you can call the office for more information. Shoeboxes do need to be returned by November 15th. Faith families, we have another drive-by coming up just for you. On November 21st from 10 to 11 a.m., we have our hot chocolate drive-by. Come pick up some snacks to keep you warm this winter. Register by emailing me at summer at before November 18th. We are partnering with Rose City Kids to fill Christmas bags with toys for some of the kids in our community. These kids are ages 4 to 15. We're looking specifically for toys, toiletries, or school supplies. If you would like to donate, you can leave your donation at the Connect Center or drop by the office sometime during the week. Donations do need to be in by November 29th. Come donate and help support Rose City Kids and our community. We are having another session of Growth Track happening November 25th from 7 to 8 in the Worship Center. At Growth Track, you can learn more about Faith Welland, our community, our vision, our values, and how you can get involved here at the church. For more information, you can email Pastor Dave at dave at faithwelland.com to register or for any other questions that you may have. Thank you for your faithful giving. If you're watching online, you can head over to our Faith Welland website and find the Give tab to support us here at the church. If you're in-house, you can head over to the back of the worship center at the end of the service to one of those boxes that is mounted on the walls and you can give there. These were your morning announcements. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and have a great service. Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. If you can stand up, put your masks on, and let's worship God together.
serve, who has, who has left off the dead in us and who has picked up the life in us and has made us new. And so we are going to sing about how we needed rescue, but how he saved us and how he brought us from the pit and pulled us out and he has brought us into his presence. And let's just enjoy that this morning. But you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now you're, cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name You called my name We just want to celebrate that. We want to um, embrace that environment that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us this morning. And so we're going to sing this song. And when you feel like you get the word, the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us.
Let's sing that chorus one more time. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. God, we thank you so much for who you are, God, for the fact that you lead us into the places that you want us to go, God. And all we have to do is just obey, God. And so open our hearts to hear what you have to speak to us today. Open our hearts to, to, to obey what you want for us today, God. May you just speak into us all of the things you feel for us, God. We love you. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. If you don't mind sitting down, um, you can take your mask off. We're going to watch Remembrance Day video followed by um, some time of silence. Well, good morning and greetings to my family of faith wherever you are today. Whether you're meeting in person in a church or you're at home watching live streaming or this on the internet, I greet you and glad to be with you. As COVID-19 has had a serious impact on all of our society, our lives, our health, livelihood, and all that makes up our society, it has also had an impact on our Remembrance Day activities and, and Remembrance celebrations. The Chief of Defense Staff has instructed all forces personnel to avoid large in-person gatherings so that we can maintain uh, health and readiness for action at any time. And so it is my pleasure today to be able to come to you and share this virtual Remembrance Day activity. So why do we have these Remembrance Day services? I know that uh, most people will think about World War I and World War II and likely my junior high students from my Sunday school class are thinking, yeah, he's old enough to have served in World War II. But sad to say, no, I'm not quite that old, kids. Uh, but we do remember World War I ended on the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour in 1918. We remember that 20 million people died and that 21 million people were injured and that over 66,000 Canadian soldiers lost their lives in that war and another 172,000 were injured and came home. That was 3% of the entire Canadian population at that time. World War II ended on the 2nd of September 1945 with 70 to 85 million people who perished and 45,000 plus Canadian soldiers who died during that war. The Korean War, the Cold War, and the longest war that Canada was ever in was the Afghanistan War of 13 years. We gather to remember their sacrifice. But not only theirs. Think of Canadian Forces personnel who over 175,000 of our military personnel have served as peacekeepers around the world. And so we take this day to remember and to give thanks for those who served and sacrificed for us. Now I know when we speak of military identity that you think of the uniform. You see the uniform and it is a symbol, but it is a symbol of something that is deeper. Our military identity is based on three principles. The first one is voluntary military service. The second one is unlimited liability. And the third, is service before self. The fallen, the wounded, the broken, all chose to serve and protect the Canadian population and our allies before caring for themselves. Now, not all sacrifices include death. I think of my great uncle, Leslie Boyd, who served in the artillery 
in Europe during the Second World War and participated in the liberating of Holland. After the war was over and he returned home, although he was not wounded, his life was forever changed. Fifty years later, he returned to Holland for the celebration of the uh, anniversary of the liberation of that country. And while there, he had flashbacks of the battle that so damaged him that he had to be hospitalized for a time. Because even after such a long time, he suffered from PTSD. So not all sacrifices end in death. And not all battles are in war. During this time of the COVID pandemic, Canadian Forces personnel have been sent and gone into long-term care facilities in Ontario and Quebec so that they could provide care and medical services to those who were most vulnerable and who seemed to be attacked by the virus more than anyone else. And they put their own lives in danger so that they could provide care and service for others. This is service before self. So even as our Canadian military personnel serve to protect our Canadian values and people here and around the world, today I want to call us to action. Let us remember the fallen, the wounded, and the broken. Let us care for those who have served, whether it's through our society, the church, or as individuals. Let's care for them. Let's learn from their example, service before self. Especially during this pandemic period, let's not become polarized and angry, but let us voluntarily take restrictions like the wearing of the mask that are meant to benefit others and to protect the society at large. Let's take a moment and thank a veteran for their service. As a Christian, I remember that the heart of our faith is this, Greater love has no person than this, than to lay down their life for their friends. Jesus died for us and for all of humanity so that new life would be made available to all without discrimination. Thank you. If um, everyone could rise for the national anthem, please. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons come. Car ton bras s'est porté l'épée, il s'est porté la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée de plus brillant exploit. Father, we pray for our country. We are mindful, Lord, of recent events, even south of the border. We have a picture of what it looks like when a country is divided. And a house that's divided against itself will not stand. 
And so, Lord, we pray for this country. We pray everything from, from municipalities to provinces to, to federal agencies. And, Lord, for every individual, for every home, for every family unit, businesses, so many people uncertain about their today, let alone their tomorrow. Lord, we pray for our country. We invite you. We humble ourselves and we ask for your help. Your help to guide us to make a difference where we are, but also to recognize that there is an extent of need in this country that just will not be met unless you intervene and help. And so, Lord, we ask that you would look on us, that you would help us. As we're looking today in your word about how you cared for a nation and brought a leader in Moses, Lord, you care about the nation we are in. And so we ask that you would help, that you would help us, that you would help our leaders, that you would guide us and lead us, that those who have made sacrifices will not have made them in vain, that we will honor and cherish the sacrifices made by being good stewards with our today. God, I pray that as we go to your word, you would lead us and guide us, that you would call us individually in a particular task in the whole. And uh, we are willing to hear and ready to go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Take your Bibles and you can turn to Exodus chapter 4. And um, thank you, Dina and Pastor Mike, worship team, Summer, for leading today. And um, I'm excited about this message today. This is a very important message. I know I, it's like uh, I've got all kinds of favorites. Uh, Pam goes to throw one of my T-shirts. I said, let's throw that one out. That's one of my favorites. I've got a, a lot of favorites. So this is, a, this is a, a f- probably right up there. If I were to have a top ten list of, of Scripture, uh, different accounts, this would be right up there. And uh, this question, I remember preaching this when I was in, in Kenya. I even know the, what do you have in your hand? The question, unanini mokononi, uh, the Swahili question. Um, what do you have in your hand? And I love it because, not just because of its, uh, the story account of Moses, the miracles that are there, but the, the profound truth that God can do amazing, extraordinary things with something that's really just quite ordinary. And that includes you and I. There is no one here that God cannot use. Before I get started, I just want to just mention, some of you may know, um, thinking of remembering, we remember Ed, Benny, and, and Maggie. Uh, they were longtime members here before they moved up to Fort Erie, and uh, Ed passed away recently, uh, just this week. And so we want to pray for Maggie and the family, and, um, and remember them in our prayers. We're doing this series on excuses. And you don't need to, uh, in case... Um, you don't have a good excuse. We, we definitely don't need to go to the internet, search Google for some excuses in serving God. Uh, we seem to just come up with those, don't we? Uh, we seem to just find uh, the excuse. When, when God is calling us closer, get right with him, we think, well, later, right now, maybe, maybe I find a perfect time. Maybe when I get to church or when, uh, when I have an invitation, uh, I would go to the altar to pray if there was an invitation. I just need the, the right moment. Maybe perhaps you're thinking, I, I got too much going on right now, God, to do what you've asked me to do. Or perhaps you say, well, you know, it's not my personality. I, I've just, I'm a little too shy. Or maybe you, you use the spiritual example saying, that's not my spiritual gifting to share my faith. Maybe you start recalling your past and say, you know what, I've tried that and it didn't work, so I don't want to try it anymore. That doesn't work for a fisherman. How many times do you cast before you get a strike? You just keep casting. What are people going to think? I can never live up to those expectations. I see those other people doing it. They do it so much better than me. I'm nobody. I'm not important. It's too late for me. I'm old. Let other people, let the next generation take, off, take over. Maybe you're thinking, I don't want to... I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to be wrong. Moses, when he was asked to do an amazing, amazing thing for God, to deliver his people out of 400 years of captivity, he started offering excuses, saying, I am unknown, or I'm unknowing. I, I really don't know. Next week, I'm unable, and the week after, I'm unwilling. Today, there's a, and we remember last week, Moses was talking about, you know, who am I, who am I going to say sent me? And, well, the, I am sent you. 
And then it's interesting in our text today because then he starts saying, well, what if they don't believe me when I said that you appeared to me? What if someone is in disagreement with me? What do I do then? Well, we know what we do in our world today, don't we? It's happening all the time. As soon as there's a disagreement, right away, everyone, they start throwing poisonous darts, right? We start, we start ready, we're going for the kill. We start fighting. And so we're a little bit nervous. What about if I share my opinion or share a truth, especially something that might be spiritual or something relates to God or religion? Then we know that, what if they don't believe the same way? Uh-oh, we have got opposite sides. We're gonna, we've started a fight. We don't bring up religion and politics. That's the big right right now. Everybody will walk in on eggshells, depending on if you bring something up. You're, you're, with a country so divided, you're bound to then draw lines and start fights. Well, it's interesting that Moses starts offering all these excuses. Many, many Christians are unfruitful in their spiritual walk. I believe are underachieving in some ways to their redemptive potential because they feel they're not qualified or they care too much about what other people think about what God's called them to do. There's no doubt that God has a call on our life. And sometimes it's just how do we do this and what's it look like? You know, we often tend to look at, at, at something of how, uh, how we feel we can do it. When God calls us, we take an inventory, right? God, God says, here's what I'd like you to do. We start saying to ourselves. Is that something I can do? Is this something I can accomplish? And we start a, right away with the wrong conversation because if it's something God's asking us to do, he will ask us to do things that we can't do. This happens over and over and over. In fact, if it's something that's really where we're going to need to depend on God, then of course we can't do it. It requires faith. And so because we take an inventory, God asks us to do something, we start saying, can we do this in our own strength? We think, no, so then we wait until we think that we can do it. For someone listening today, here in, on, in, on site or online, I am so excited for you today because today is going to be the day of the next day of your spiritual life. Forget walking around, moping around, just barely existing Christianity. This is not the Christianity God has for you. That today, if you're willing to take the step today, your life will begin today. You will see as you stop making excuses for God not using you and step out in faith and believe that he can use you, your world will open up. You will walk into things and see God do things in your life. You say, how come we don't see miracles anymore? I'll tell you the reason why. You point right back at yourself. You look in the mirror because there is no more blaming anybody else out there or any preacher that is or isn't preaching that God is real, but he is a real God. He wants to do real miracles, real amazing things in your life if you will let him. And today is the day to stop making those excuses and walk into this reality. The Spirit of God can use you where you are. He can use you with what you have to do all that he has called you to do by his Spirit's power working in you. Moses was authorized. He was called by God, but he was afraid to step out in faith. It's one of our worries We don't want to preach or teach or step out in faith. We fear rejection and what people will think, that they will argue with us, they will oppose us. Moses has returned to Egypt after 40 years. His last attempt of trying to deliver or deal with injustice in Egypt did not go well. He reserved to fighting. As soon as he saw someone, and and listen to me, I want to be careful with this, but, but I fear that too often we fall in the ways of the world. We try to fight with fists and with words. We oppose, we, we, we defend. And, and, and hear me, I'm not saying we, we need to stand up for what is right, but we must not do it in the ways of the world. We don't fight against, this is a scripture, we don't, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Jesus overcame death, and destruction in the whole world by sacrifice. Not with bare knuckles or by swords, even though Peter tried to do it that way. Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not my way. 
Instead, he heals the ear that was wounded. God sends him back. Last time, he had a disagreement with an Egyptian. He ended up fighting, murdering, and paying for it. Now he used to go back. It's interesting what we, how we deal with rejection, isn't it, and how it, how it affects our present and our future. Maybe you've been rejected. You know, that sports team, you tried, you worked hard, you didn't make it, you felt like you weren't in the in crowd. Or maybe at school you've been rejected. Maybe perhaps you were, you've been humiliated in the past and felt you were set aside. You weren't asked to join the group or you were kicked out of the group or you were not given the job you were applied for or you lost your job for no particular reason or you were laid off during this time of COVID. It hurts, it feels, it's rejection. Let me ask you the first kind of uh, discussion question if we can start here. What, how can we go, so we don't like being rejected. So how do you typically prevent from being rejected? What is it that you do to try to guard yourself from being rejected? Take a few seconds and think about it, discuss. Typically, if we have a situation that we feel like we are in danger or we're at risk, we will, we will, there's flight, I'm getting out of here. There's freeze, we, we you know, that's uh, often, there's many uh, animals that are often prey, uh, rabbits, pheasants, when they think they're hidden and they're in danger, they just freeze and hope that no one sees them. And there's fight. I'm not sure which one you typically choose. Flight freeze or fight but we know that we do not like rejection and here's the problem if you're so afraid of being rejected then you will freeze or fight or flight whatever you do however you choose it is a hindrance not only for you seeing what God can do in your life but it's a hindrance of the amazing things that God can do in other people's lives when you choose fear over faith, it's not just you that is affected. There are other people that are being robbed of a great experience as well. We cannot afford to ask the question, what if they don't believe? If we start down that road, we begin shackling ourselves, preventing ourselves from moving forward. The question is not, what if they don't believe? The question you need to ask yourself is what if they do believe? You see, we got it all wrong. If they do believe, then a lost will be found. Someone who is sick will be healed. Someone who's experiencing death will come alive. What if they do believe? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. Too often we're caught up in what if they don't believe. God calls ordinary people to do extraordinary things. When? I'll tell you when. When does a candle start to shine? As soon as it's lit. Don't tell me you got to put in five years before God starts using you to pray for somebody. That's bunk. It's now. As soon as the Spirit of God lights your soul, you have a mission, a part of the kingdom of God to advance the kingdom. Look at how many times in the New Testament Jesus would heal somebody, do a miracle, and right away they start telling people about the amazing things God's done in their life. The woman at the well began a witness before she straightened her life up. Do you know that? I mean, God's ministering her at the well, and she's got a messed up personal life, and he, she experiences new life, and immediately she starts telling people about the amazing things God's done in her life. She didn't wait get her life all straightened out, get herself theologically correct, make sure she's checking all the boxes of moral purity. No, she, right away she started talking about what Jesus did in her life. When does a candle start shining as soon as it's lit? When does a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, begin fulfilling that mission? Day one. Acceptance. See, Moses was more concerned about his rejection than God's possible rejection. What if they don't believe me, verse one? 
Or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. It's his third excuse. He's not struggling with the message, what God's called him to do. He's not struggling with the task. He's struggling with the messenger. We will do nothing for God if we continue to offer excuses or concern ourselves with whether or not we might be rejected. Rejection and the fear of rejection is a massive impediment. It keeps Christians and keeps churches weak. It places a greater value on us rather than on God. It makes the fear of people's opinion our greatest fear, and it sets aside a fear of God, a healthy fear of God. Listen to this one, and you might need to, uh, this is a bit of a head shaker. I came across this a week or so ago, shared it with a pastor friend of mine who was going through a difficult time. Francis Fragapan said this, to inoculate me from the praise of people, God baptized me in the criticism of people to free me from the control of people. How's that? You're being criticized, you're being attacked, people looking down at you, people rejecting you. God is just inoculating you. He's freeing you from being controlled by the opinion of people. Because if you care more about what people think of you than of what God is asking you to do, you will be weak in your spiritual life. John 10, when Jesus was asked, when he's dealing with the question, what if they don't believe me? Listen to this. Do not believe me unless I do the works of the Father. But if I do do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. I love this, and it's getting to where we're going a little bit later. Stop worrying about whether they're going to believe whether God appeared to you or not. I'll tell you what. You just go ahead and do it. Let, leave the results up to God, and he will confirm that he has called you and he's working in your life. Don't be worried about yourself. Don't be trying to figure out, how do I convince them? I, and we do this sometimes with the gifts of the Spirit. We try to say, God told me this. We try to set them up a little bit. We try to tee it up. Make sure people know that God spoke to us. Never mind that. Just be obedient. And, and if it's a word that came from God, it will hit them right between the eyes. You don't need to set it up. God doesn't need you to promote him doesn't need you to, to market him. If he appeared to you, then he will do great things. Let that be the confirmation. Amen. Being questioned didn't stop Jesus. He just continued to obey the Father. Okay, let's get into this. As long as Moses obeyed, God's authority would come from God on his life. Moses when he's presented by God with this great and miraculous plan, obviously Moses had a few questions. No doubt his past mistakes were probably on his mind, robbing him of his confidence. His, his inventory, when he's knowing what he can do compared to what he's being asked to do, feeling like he is his unable, under-equipped. His focus is all wrong. His focus is on him and not on God. We get so wrapped up at times. Even when God's talking, we are so wrapped up in the questions we want to ask God, we fail to answer the question he's asking us. This is one of my favorite parts of the scripture. God asked so many questions. Jesus asked 183 questions and only directly answered three of them. We would really get somewhere, I feel like, in our Christian walk if we, instead of, of bombarding God with all our questions, that we would just answer the questions he is asking us. These are questions that we need to answer. No one can answer for us. Let me ask, let's pause here. I'm going to share my question, a question that God often asks me. What is a question that God often asks you? Whether it's a personal time, during a sermon, or when you're just driving or praying, but a question that God often asks you. Think about it and discuss a little bit.
Now when I say this, I'm not talking about hearing the audible voice of God, but I, I mean those, that thought that drops in your mind, and you know, all of a sudden as you begin to, it's like you have a therapist in the room, but there's no one in the room with you, and you have this kind of dialogue with yourself, and you're kind of sorting it out, and, and the therapist is asking some of those tough questions. For me, oftentimes when I'm here, and I've had it happen right here, praying of a situation that's going on in the church or in my life, and I'm struggling with it, and then I'm bringing it to God in prayer, this is probably the most common question I get asked of God, why does this bother you so much? <laughs> I hate that question. I want to keep offering him the thing, ask him to fix it. He goes, well, before I get to fixing it, why does it bother you so much? And then as I begin to answer that question, we begin to get sorting out what's really going on, getting down to the heart of the matter. Moses was called to a great plan, was feeling like he had no authority to accomplish this, no ability. How was God going to get across the message that this plan was something that God was going to do through him miraculously? Well, he was going to use a question and a simple thing like a staff. Then the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? A staff. <laughs> I love this. Moses has got this great big plan. They're having this conversation. There's a burning bush, all this other stuff. And, and, and Moses offers these questions. What if they don't believe you appeared to me? What's in your hand? Now, right away, I'm thinking, how is that an answer to my question? Right? He's trying to think of, what's, what's a good response to this? They're doubting whether or not you're, you've appeared to me and you've called me this task. He just says, a, st I, I, a, a staff? I, a, a stick? What did Moses need to be able to do the job? He didn't say, what do you don't have? And oftentimes we do this, don't we? Yeah, but I'm not educated. I don't have this. I'm not, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of time. I'm, we start coming up with what we don't have. Forget that. Make today an inventory of what you do have. Do you have health? Do you have strength? Do you have time? Can you pray? Can you go? Can you text? Can you bake? Can you talk? What do you have? He's asking you not what you don't have. He didn't say, Moses, well, do you have this? No. Ah, too bad. I was going to use you. <laughs> oh, man. Here all this time. I, I should have read the resume. I, I didn't read it. He had what he needed. A staff. Now, it wasn't just the staff he would use. The staff was used to, interestingly enough, to guide sheep. Would, would Moses not be used of God to guide his people? This staff was used to extract sheep from danger situation. Would this, would this staff not be used to pull the people of God out of Egypt? It was used to correct. It was his work tool. It was his, his hammer, his pen, his computer, his truck, his, his, his backpack, his, his drill press. It, it, it was... Just something that he was part of what he did every day. What is that simple, ordinary thing that you might be overlooking and thinking, this is just regular, but God says, this is something I can do amazing things with. What is in your hand? This staff, by itself, would not be a formidable weapon against the enemy of Egypt. But yielded to God, it would be a symbol of God's great power. What is in your hand? Ononini mukononi. I know there's nobody here that speaks Swahili, but anyways, I can say it. I just love the way it sounds, actually. What is in your hand? Little boy's lunch, feeding thousands. <laughs> or you think about the man who gave a tomb that would be used as the place that would demonstrate God's ability to to give resurrection power to a dead body. I'll give you my tomb. Feeling like, wow, it's just a grave. Huh. It would not just be a grave. A symbol of life forever from that moment. It might be a, a lunch meal, a, a text. It might be your car. During COVID, I love how we have had people step up, volunteers, and just say, I want to help. What can I do to help? And they just take their car and, and deliver groceries to people and meals to people and newsletters to people that are feeling alone. Uh, Pastor Mike, and I'm bragging on a few, but a need came up. There was a, a seat there and sat down with a person he'd never met before and just helped tune the guitar and, and just showed that he cared. 
It's, he just he knows how to tune a guitar. Why not, why not use that to show a little bit of God's love? Or, or Fritz, uh, Kevin Boyd, who, who can do stained glass, is learning gifted at doing stained glass. And so he does a little stained glass night and so people can come and, and, and to raise some money for people that are helping other people. Something that God can just, just something regular, but God could do amazing things. See, it's the average. God can do extraordinary things with something that's just ordinary. It was a staff that he had in his hand. Simple. But touched by God will become a symbol that is supernatural. God sometimes may ask you to do something very ordinary. But it will lead to something miraculous. My, my dad, I remember my dad saying this phrase, the supernatural is best done naturally. I like this. Because so often we wait for the big and the pomp and the circumstance before we're obedient. We want it to make it look like a heaven agenda thing and realize we are walking and missing so many opportunities because they're just natural opportunities. They just are just simple. They're not, they're not extraordinary. They become extraordinary, but they begin as very simple things. What God asked me, he said, what's in your hand? I have a staff. And then we say, okay, what's he going to tell him to do with the staff? He just says, throw it on the ground. Now, some of you teenagers that love this, I think maybe that's, uh, they're trying to do that with their shirts and their pants and their clothes and their shoes and their hats and their lunch bags. Just throw it on the ground. You're expecting miracles all around our house. We, they're going to just, uh, somehow they're going to get washed. It's, and they are. They're going to just, uh, I thought the miracle was going to happen there, but it didn't. But just know this, I'm giving my net message away. Uh, God did tell Moses to pick it up again. So if, uh, for any of those teenagers that are waiting for the miracle, I think it might be time to pick it up again. But he said, just throw it down. Now, why is this important? Here's why it's important. Take whatever it is that's ordinary, what you have, and let go of it. Stop trying to do it in your own strength, in your own authority. We need to let go. Now, he he takes this thing that it's been a part of what he's done and, and lets go of it. In obedience to God, let's go. It turns into a snake. Now, I kind of believe it turned into a cobra. Why? Because I think there's a parallel here between Egypt. You've all seen the, head, the headdress, sorry, that uh, Pharaoh has with the cobra that's on the front. I think that's what I, that's just me. It doesn't say it was a cobra. It says it's a snake, but I kind of believe it was a cobra. But whatever it was, it was a snake that scared the bejeebers out of Moses. He jumped back as soon as he saw it. When Moses obeys this, this stick, is transformed. Moses spent a lot of time in Egypt. He would know the power of Egypt's might. And he would all know, also know the danger of a snake. Now he was scared. Whatever he was scared of, he jam- jumped back as soon as he saw the snake. I think you and I would do the same thing. God transformed that staff into a symbol of God's given authority. Verse 4, then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took a hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. A simple staff, touched by God. Tells him to pick it up. Okay, if you thought, you know, I think throwing the staff down, turning it into a snake, that's just crazy. Reaching down to pick it up? That is some serious craziness. Right? I mean, the first one, what God was calling Moses to was obedience. Now this one, God's calling him to faith and obedience. (laughs) Because the first one, he just dropped it. He didn't know it was anything involved. He just dropped it. The second miracle required obedience and a lot of faith. He reached down, grabbed it by its tail, and it turned back into a staff. Now at this point, in his hand, just a few moments later, it looks very much like it did just five minutes earlier. It's just a staff, but it's not just a staff. This staff, now let go, touched by God, and returned back to Moses, this would be the thing that would defeat the armies of Egypt. It would be through this staff and using 
particularly had a part to play in convincing Israel that God had sent Moses. It would be this staff that would be used in front of Pharaoh and the magicians to show that God was a powerful God. It would be this staff that would miraculously be used to turn the Nile red. It would be this staff that God would work through to bring the frog plague and the gnat plague and the lightning and the hail plague. It would be this staff that would bring the locust plague and it would be this staff that would part the Red Sea as soon as it touched it. This was not just a stick anymore. This staff represented God's power to do extraordinary things beyond our ability. It was not just a staff. It was something that Moses needed to let go of. He didn't need something new. He just needed to surrender to God and see God do something great. Just as Moses would have this little personal demonstration of his power with right there all by himself. And he believed when he saw what God did in transforming the staff. God would also make himself known to many others by displaying his miraculous power in the same way and people would believe. Verse 5 and then 17. This, said the Lord, in other words, this little demonstration, is so that they might believe and the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then verse 17. Take this staff in your hand so you can perform signs with it or miracles with it. He failed 40 years earlier. He saw an injustice in Egypt and he tried to do it in his own strength and power and he failed miserably and paid for it. This was going to be different. Why? Because God was going to do the miracle. Enough fighting. It's not in our own strength or our own power. As I said earlier in Ephesians 6, we struggle not against flesh and blood. The staff of God was going to be used to confront the powers of this world. It's not by might, as we hear in the prophets, and not by power, but by the Spirit of God, says the Lord. We don't fight in the way that the world appears fighting, but we do not surrender to the world. We surrender to God. Paul recalls his ministry among the Corinth church. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling, he said. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, was not arguing with you, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest in human wisdom, but on God's power. Hear me, church. And yes, I did prepare today and plan my words and try to be as clear as I can when I speak, but but it is not going to show people that, that God has called me. When you go, it's not an arguing. Don't try to do it in your own strength. Depend on God to do amazing things. Why? Because when he does things beyond our ability, then it's him that gets the credit. Okay, so I'm going to sum it up here with a few things, and then we're going to close this off. Why we need to stop making excuses. Learning from Moses' life. Here's why we need to stop making excuses. Because excuses hinder people from accomplishing victories. The habit of making excuses puts our focus on the obstacles. We spend way too much time discussing and deliberating on whether we can't rather than how God can. We need to put more concentrated effort onto what God can do than on what we think we can't do. Look at the ten spies that went into the promised land. They came back, looked at the same thing as the other two, but all they could talk about was how great it was, but how impossible of a task. We can't do it. They started making excuses why we couldn't. They're too big. The people are strong. The cities are fortified. They're very large. And we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. Two people, Joshua and Caleb, they came home with a we can message. But do you know it only took one night for the excuses and the we can't to take over everybody's hearts and minds and make them slaves? And they all started to believe we can't do it because 10 people had a we can't focus rather than we can because God can. What a shame. 
So many lives are destroyed because of excuses. Excuses is the nail that builds the house of failure. It makes victims out of victors. We need to stop making excuses because excuses reveals a lack of faith. Judges chapter 6, Gideon is called to be a, a valiant warrior of God, to lead God's people again out of, out of oppression, like Moses. He was given a mission, called a valiant warrior. Listen to his response in Judges 6. How, Lord, shall I deliver Israel? My family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Just say this. Stop doubting God. If God says that you are a valiant warrior, you are a valiant warrior. If God says that he is going to use you to accomplish something great, then believe him. But every time you put yourself down and you check yourself out because you feel like you don't qualify or because you feel like you don't have the authority, then you are doubting God's ability to do his work in your life. You are questioning God. You are doubting God. Have faith in God. When he says, you are more than a conqueror, have faith in God. Here's another one. And I mean, just you're wondering if this is a bit of a pep talk here, but here's another reason why you need to stop making excuses when it comes to obeying God, because God does not accept excuses. You might think, well, Pastor Jamie, don't you think it's a little hard? Listen to this one. He doesn't accept excuses, so he makes it possible so that you don't have an excuse. In Romans it says, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what is made, so that they are without an excuse. The one talent man that he had his, and others were given talents, but the one talent man didn't want to take a risk. He was scared of being, uh, making a mistake, so he buried it. What's the master say? The master came back and answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy slave, he says. I do not accept that excuse. You know why we make excuses? Why we should stop making excuses? I mean, we know it. We know we shouldn't do it. We do it oftentimes. But the thing is, we've got into a habit of it. We've got a habit of excuses. I don't know, maybe have you ever made an excuse and have a regret for making that excuse? Maybe let's do that one more time, a little discussion before I close this off. What is an excuse regret that you have? An excuse regret. Take a few seconds. to share with you an excuse regret that I heard my grandfather talk about. It's really kind of one of the main points of my message today. I was uh, able to uh, bless enough to see my grandpa in his later years and he was a simple education, not a very high education. It was like an elementary school education. A farmer, hard working man. Early in his young marriage, he had a couple kids. He came into a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit baptized him and, and he started to work out his salvation fear and trembling but was a man of faith I knew him as a strong man of faith and a strong man he, he would hold us kids and throw us around with big arms and hands I remember seeing his hands and how wide and thick they were I remember chopping down trees and seeing him pull a tree out all by himself my cousin and I were scrambling for the other piece of wood and but he's a mighty man of power and prayer. We would always end a family time with prayer. So it was, a, it was a particularly interesting conversation where he would talk to my father that would stand out to me. In his, he had Parkinson's in his older years and he would, he would shake hard to get words out, so I'm going to say them quickly, but it took a while for him to describe what he was wanting to get across to my father. He said to my dad, George, you didn't have to die. See, my dad is one of nine and uh, Georgie was a 
uh, a brother of my father's that died, I think it was when he was eight or nine years old. And my dad said, you know, dad, you don't have to, you know, don't, and my, my grandpa said, let me finish, David. Spoke to my father, my father, you know, okay, fine, let you finish. He said, Georgie didn't have to die. See, Georgie got what was called old people pneumonia as a little boy. You hear today with COVID-19 and flu and pneumonia and respiratory problems and diseases, we've had many of these recently. Well, this is one that was uh, taking lives. So Georgie didn't have to die, and my, even though my father tried to discourage him from having regrets, he, he continued down this path, and he said, here's why. He said, I, I was young, I, I didn't know better, I was I, I thought, I, I saw pastors praying for people and I heard about the anointing and I thought I had to have the anointing in order to pray for him to be healed. And I was waiting for the anointing. And the anointing didn't come. I, I thought maybe it would have to be a, the elders had to pray for him or, or the pastor or the evangelist. Had, I'd seen people healed, but, but I didn't think he would heal somebody through me. So I, I waited for the anointing or I waited for an anointed preacher or someone to pray for him. And Georgie died. And Georgie didn't have to die. So as he described, again, my dad tried to intercept. He said, let me finish. Because he said a little while later, your brother Lorne, some of you might know Lauren Shepherd, your brother Lorne got diphtheria, another serious infection that affects the, the breathing and heart function and can cause paralysis and even death. But Grandpa said, I didn't wait for the anointing. I didn't wait for some anointed person to pray for him. As soon as it was desperate, your mom and I, we got down on our knees and we prayed for God to heal our son. You see, he said, Georgie didn't have to die. But God healed Lorne. From that moment on, a young Christian, it marked my grandpa. That is why, and I can tell you so many times, I've heard the stories of even pastors or people in the Kingston area that would talk about how your, your Uncle Lorne, your Grandpa Lorne, he would, he would pray and this person was healed and that person was saved. And he would go get people and bring them to church and he was absolutely sold out from that moment on. He had regret. But from that moment, God taught him a truth. Don't ever wait for someone else to do what I'm calling you to do. We have a need today, even now, and uh, we have we're, the second service. Roger Wilcox is going to be watching the service, and his, he's got a need home with his wife, Jeanette. I'm just telling you what I'm going to challenge them to do. I'm going to challenge Jeanette to put her hands on her husband and to pray for him right there at home. You might be watching this. I'm not sure. You have a situation in need. We're ready to pray for you. But you don't need a special anointed person. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. You have the spirit of Christ within you. God can do a miracle through your life. Step out in faith. Here's how you overcome your excuses as we close off. You need to have faith. You can do all things through Christ. This is something, it's truth, it's God's word. You need to believe this today. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Stop believing in yourself or doubting yourself. Believe in God. I can do all things. When we make excuses, repeat them often, we start to believe them. You need to, maybe some, you need to quote this every morning, every night for the next month until it sinks in. Have faith like Paul. Second, you need to stop expecting perfect situations before you take action. This is just practical steps. We want it to be all set up. I'll share my faith. I'm just waiting for the right moment. I'll pray for them. I just want to write the right, I just need the right song playing in the background. I just, you're looking for the perfect situation. Stop looking for a perfect situation before you obey. You see the 10 lepers, they experienced a miracle. Not after, I mean, I know the phrase that says, good things come to those who wait. That might be true in some situations when you're waiting for baked bread or something, but... 
It is not the truth in coming to the things of good. God asks you to do something. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When he asks you to do it, do it then, even if it doesn't even make sense. See, he says he healed the lepers, and they were not yet healed, but they went on their way to have their healing confirmed, and it says while they were on the way, they were healed. It's obedience. Stop looking for the perfect situation, saying, I will, I'll, I'll share my faith when I know exactly what I need to say. Stop trying to make things perfect before you obey. Obey. See God do the miracle. Realize the potential that God has given you. You know, the worship team come. Realize the potential that God has given you that you have in Christ. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You. Do you believe that verse? Do you live according to that verse? I love Micah when all these false prophets were making excuses in Micah's day. Here's what it says about Micah. I am filled with power, he said, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and with courage. I love this statement. He knows who he is in Christ. He knows who he is in God. I am filled with power from God, from the spirit of the Lord. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then it gives you life. Life flows in you and through you to those around you. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a spirit of power, love, a sound mind. So do you hear it today? What's in your hand? If we continually to make excuses, we will fall short of our redemptive potential. God wants to do some amazing things, and he wants to use you. I've asked the team to be able to play a song today. It's just simply a prayer for him to do it again. What do you have in your hand? If you ask God to touch it, you might think this is ordinary and simple. It is until it's been baptized and touched and transformed by the power of God. Make simple things available to him and see God do great things. 400 years of captivity. So many years. Day in, day out, year in, year out. Oppression, slavery, bondage ended because an ordinary slave boy and a simple staff were transformed by a great God. God can deliver. God can do the miraculous. And God can and will use you. Would you stand with me? Put on your mask. Would you sing this as your prayer this morning as we close off the service? Just invite the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Make yourself available. Your
I pray you'd open their eyes. You'd free them from the shackle of the opinion of people or rejection. They would walk by faith and not by sight. For your glory, do things in and through us that we could not accomplish. So you will be lifted up. In Jesus' name, I'm looking forward to hearing about the stories of how heaven has touched 
your earth and the earth around you as you make available to him the simple and the ordinary this week. God bless you as you go. Thank you. Go in his grace and in his power.